Vincent, a uh, very warm welcome here at MN Energy Solutions in Copenhagen and specifically a warm welcome here in this premises in the research center, which is the heart of this two-stroke engine. We are proud uh, of being part of your uh, decarbonization strategy. Thank you, Uwe, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, we're just a couple of weeks away uh, from a big milestone in, uh, in our decarbonization journey. And we've done that together in collaboration with you at uh, MAN Energy Solution, with shipyards, and also with fuel manufacturers. We're going to really move from putting targets for decarbonization to actually showing action in a very, very tangible way uh, here in Copenhagen for the name giving of, uh, of this first vessel. So it's a great opportunity, I think, for us to, to be here and to share a few thoughts about the journey so far, but also the many steps that we have ahead before we reach the goal that we have. This is a journey that does not only involve companies, but where actually collaboration between private sector and public sector is really important in order to create proper incentive and the right framework for this uh, energy transition to take place. How do you at MAN Energy think about the framework and what you need in order to help MAN Energy make the right choices also from a business perspective? We cannot do it by ourselves. Such a transition needs more partners, more stakeholders, stakeholders like you. The shipping industry, transportation sector specifically, we need to talk about um, alternative fuels. The fundamental thing which we all as a society, which we need to understand is where does the fuel come from? It has to be green, which means we need green electricity and there it starts. So it takes some time until maybe 2030, until we have the quantity of alternative fuels available which we really need. The maritime industry needs, uh, needs to replace around about 300 million tons of heavy fuel oil. What does that mean? So hydrogen on one side is playing a significant role, but also CO2 plays a significant role. So Vincent, what is your expectation after the adaption which has been just recently made on an EU level, but also on the discussion we had a couple of last weeks within the IMO? I think with these two pieces of legislation in the EU and, and with this IMO, MEPC 80, we have two really high quality pieces of uh, legislation that will provide a great framework for the industry's transformation. Uh, it's, there's a lot of details that will need to be fleshed out, especially on MEPC 80. There is quite a lot of work that needs to happen in the next year and a half to make sure that it actually lives up to its potential. But, but it sends a clear signal, first of all, that, that the industry is serious, is moving to the forefront. It sends a clear signal also to the players that sitting on the fence is no longer an option, that you need a plan to get through and to get through zero. Otherwise, it's, it's actually your business you're putting in, in jeopardy. And it sends a really powerful incentive also to parts of the ecosystem that maybe are lacking a little bit today or are a concern for us when we look at the transformation, such as the new fuel, uh, the green fuels that we will need, the quantities that we will need uh, in order to be able to execute this transition, that, that there is a market and it's a sizable market. So at MAN Energy Solution, you play an incredibly important role in the energy transition of the whole maritime sector. You're inventing the engines of the future, the engines that will power the shipping of the future. How do you relate to innovative and disruptive technology and integrate them in your value proposition to your customers? The fuel avail availability plays a key role. We are always developing right now dual fuel engines, huh? which gives you, our customers like you always the opportunity to switch over, depending on the availability, from fuel A to fuel B. In the past, it was more or less single fuel, very easy and simple. Today, nobody knows which is the right fuel. Will it be methane, ethane, uh, LPG? We have these fuels already. We have methanol already, and right now on our, te our test facility is ammonia. Having said that, of course, we need to invest a lot in R&D. We have invested just uh, again in a new research engine in order to do these prototype tests. And the engineering capability is tremendously important in order to switch over from fuel type A to B. So having the capability in-house to switch over and fast, that helps us to serve the market depending on where it goes. In order to reduce emissions, I think it's also very important to talk about digitalization because with digitalization it enables us also to optimize 
the operations of the engine and while doing that of course CO2 or let's say emissions will be reduced. How do you see that at Maersk as a ship operator from your perspective? How important is digi digitalization for you? Digitalization in general is a very central part of our strategy, but certainly also when it comes to the energy transition journey, it is something that we spend a lot of time on. And, and I would say we do it on two fronts. One of them is the one that you mentioned is optimization. So today it's how do we manage optimization on board our ships? How do we help our truckers to optimize their routings, their speeds and so on? And we have through products like Star Connect for our, for our fleet been able to really see significant uh, improvement opportunities that we've been able to capture over time to actually reduce what it takes to transport a container uh, today. So a lot of it here is about gaining the visibility of what's going on on board, how the engine's behaving, but also how the crew is behaving uh, in order to, to really optimize how we operate our assets. The second is actually just the visibility of carbon. And I think this is going to be incredibly important. We don't only execute on an energy transition, we also need to sell it to our customers. That means we need to keep uh, a carbon accounting. We need to be able to certify the, the, the abatement for our customers. And we're gonna need a whole infrastructure to keep our carbon accounting going and actually creating that visibility and understanding all the complexities of our own operation today is also quite a big requirement that will only be reached through digitization and ultimately connecting those two parts together. How do you prepare from shifts in demand for fuel? There are so many things we don't know today and, and new fuel will emerge and, and companies will make different choices. How do you anticipate that and, prefer, and prepare for something like this? I mean, basically, what is really important, of course, we cannot do a retrofit on all type of engines. So from an economical perspective, certainly the age plays a role, the size of the engine plays a role, and also the question comes up, which type of fuel does our um, customer want to use in the future. So the fact is that we are retrofitting all engines towards dual fuel. That helps the customer, means the ship operator always, to have a kind of a flexibility. Sooner or later, the retrofit topic is not only covered on the engine itself, the system which is involved. The system, the fuel gas supply system handling methanol and all other uh, systems which you need to implement, tanks which, we, which needs to be modified. And that brings me exactly to the point that the close collaboration between the shipyard, the ship owner and our team is necessary in order to make it happen. This is really important because we've lived for, as far as we can remember, with only one fuel. And now we're going to have an industry that has multiple fuel and certainly it's true for Maersk as well as a company. We're fuel agnostic. So far we have a lot of orders on methanol, but one day we will have also other fuel that will coexist with methanol in, in the fleet and that, that will create a, a very important need for flexibility and closer partnership with, with the ecosystem. So Vincent, how does the energy transition on a global basis um, impact the global maritime business? I think it has already uh, started to impact it in, uh, in quite a profound way. Uh, we, have, we have to remember that a lot of the customers that we serve have made actually commitments also for decarbonizing their operation and they are putting pressure on us to actually do something and, and, and increase the partnership also towards them to help them reach the goals that they have made. So, so from a commercial perspective also, this has started to really change the conversation with, with our customers. Obviously also from an operational perspective, the way we're going to run our operation, the distribution, the, the procurement of, of the different fuel is going to be important. How we do safety also is different because it's not the same, uh, it's not the same risks that you expose your uh, colleagues to where depending on what type of technology or what type of fuel you choose uh, for the future. So it is becoming central to our operation uh, for many years to come. Mm. That, that brings me to the question, while you said clients, uh, environmental protection um, requests are getting more and more important. How do you cope with that? I think where we have had some success is with the product that we call Echo Delivery, which is really about how do we sell a credible, measurable, certifiable, net zero transportation. And, and that has been really well received. It took a few adjustments, but it has been really well received by customers who actually see this as a great tool for them to actually make progress on their, on their own roadmap. Today, more than 3% of the, of the containers that we move are actually already moving on a net zero basis, which I think is a great start 
for, for the transformation journey that we have. What they want also is they want to expand it to what they call green corridors, which is, you know, if I have to have a dirty truck bringing it to the port, then a clean shipping and then another uh, truck that burns diesel, then I don't, I cannot really claim to my own customer or consumer that, that, that the product is clean. And what we've been able to do there also is invest into infrastructure with Volvo Truck, with Einride, into having electric capabilities and, and actually also pioneer the electrification of the trucking business out in the port areas, which also I think has, has a lot of promise uh, for us. So, that, so there is a lot of, a lot of things uh, going on today and certainly an increasing demand from customers where sustainability and, and the transition to net zero is no longer some side topic but becomes actually quite central in a conversation. So we spent quite a bit of time talking about the energy transition for the maritime sector. But MAN Energy Solutions also have its own carbon footprint. So what initiatives and, and, and strategies have you put in place to reduce your own uh, operation or adjust your own operation to this, to this new operating environment for the future? Uh, you're absolutely right. So we want to build out of the company a kind of a decarbonization championship. What does that mean? Is first pillar is the maritime sector. We discussed already with alternative fuels, with new engines, but we have also other uh, products like products which we just gonna build up here in Denmark, in Espiak, heat pumps. Heat pumps being driven via, let's say, renewable energy, mm. like, like wind or solar, and uh, let's say, replacing coal-fired heating system. So that brings us down to a net, net zero level immediately. Then hydrogen plays a significant role. More than 400 million plus will be invested in the next five years on building up electrolyzers, supporting hydrogen production, because that is really important. Without hydrogen, no alternative fuels. As I said before, CO2 is gonna be very, very important. In Norway, we are building up right now a lighthouse project where we try to take out the CO2 of a cement factory. So the company has changed and we are also in a, in a transition. And of course, the company itself in producing the products needs to think about how to do it more streetwise in order to avoid emissions, which I would say it's an opportunity because we have the team here, we have the right people and we have the right products which will help our customers to decarbonize their business. And I'm really proud to be part of this team here and under the umbrella of our slogan, moving big things to zero. This is what we want to strive. And I mean, one big thing, of course, is the maritime industry. Exciting. So, Vincent, from your perspective, how do you deliver your sustainability targets? Uh, of our strategy, we have a, a big plan uh, across all of our ESG strategy. We need to be net zero by 2040. But more importantly, right now, right in front of us, we have a plan where by 2030, which may seem like far uh, in business terms, but it's actually really, really close when we think about decarbonization we need to have 25% of the containers that we move to be a net zero impact on, on the environment. And that will require a lot of, of work, a lot of collaboration uh, across the whole ecosystem. We're super happy uh, to have 25 ships on order today that will run on, uh, on, on methanol in the future. And that will really put us a, a big part of the way uh, when it comes to, uh, to the goals that we have. But as we have talked also in the previous questions, we need to continue to work on the regulatory framework. We need to continue to work with our customers on the adoption of zero, uh, net zero impact uh, transportation. What is really great is there is a strong willingness across the ecosystem and, and the ship that we will have the pleasure to, to phase in into our fleet in a, in a couple of weeks is a, is a great illustration of this. It will, on its maiden voyage, already be on green methanol, thanks to some part, the partnerships that we have had. The collaboration we have had with, with your company, with, with the shipyard, has been also fantastic, and I think it augurs well for the journey that we have ahead. So, Vincent, thanks for having this discussion, this fruitful discussion. I think uh, it's quite obvious that we share the same views once it comes to decarbonization. Um, I think it's very important that we also, and it came out, our, out of our discussion, that uh, having strong partners, partners like Maersk, like us, like others, we cannot do that alone. Different companies need to team up to make it happen. I'm proud to be part of this journey and I'm proud to 
to, to execute this project with you guys. Thanks for that. Now, thank you, Uwe. It has been a, a real pleasure to, uh, to be here, to have that dialogue, to also look at the decarbonization from a different perspective, you know, your perspective, and hear how you guys are, are thinking about this. It's such a complicated process. None of us have all the answers, and it is only through these strong partnership, as you say, to the strong uh, dialogue that we will be able to lift uh, the opportunity that, uh, that we have ahead of us. We'll have some more opportunities, I'm sure, in the future to continue to discuss this uh, very exciting topic and to look at the new development. I'm sure there is a lot of things that will surprise us in the future. But uh, you can rest assured that from, from the Maersk side, the, the, the spirit of partnership with MAN uh, Energy Solution will continue to be here and will continue to create together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.